Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Good, good. My name's Nathan. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, a couple of uh, housekeeping things. Uh, number one, um, God is moving just miraculously through Hendersonville Church, and so he's constantly adding uh, to our numbers. And so I'm gonna ask a favor. Um, I've seen a lot of people that had to park in the upper parking lot uh, today. Um, it's kind of not really a parking lot. It's a graded out old racetrack. But hey, it, it works. So here's the thing. If, if you're able-bodied um, and you get here, get here early, can, can you go ahead and park up there? Uh, a lot of us and our high capacity volunteers, when we get here early, we're parking over at the bank. Uh, they said that we could park there. And so we just want people who... Uh, may have maybe limited uh, with up in, you know, whatever the case may be, that parking up there would be a difficulty. Um, we clearly see that God is maybe leading us to go to two services. Um, no one would love to go to two services more than me, but we can't do it until we get more volunteers. Um, churches are notorious for taking 20, 30 people and just riding them to where they lose the joy of serving in the church. I've seen it happen a bazillion times. So here's the thing, we need about 16 more volunteers. Um, they're in here, you're here. So what, I, what I'm asking, what I'm asking is in the children's ministry, because that is obviously our number one um, serve challenge is the children's ministry. We've got almost 40 kids back there um, that are learning about Jesus, that are having fun. So hey, uh, we're gonna talk in just a moment um, about being available and about serving uh, because the, the goal is gonna be to serve one service and then attend one service. And yeah, I'm not naive. I know that's asking you to, to come attend a, a worship service every week. Um, not gonna apologize for that. Um, we're Christ followers. If we claim to be Christ followers, our actions need to show it. So I'm asking you to serve because I'm telling you when September rolls around, we're gonna have to go to two services. That's awesome. We want to reach Hendersonville for Jesus. We want to reach those who don't yet know Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I'll tell you the easiest way to not have anybody show up for a nine o'clock service is not to have a nine o'clock service. <laughs> but we need volunteers because I'm telling you, it's like I said, I don't know, three months ago and someone said, well, Nathan, that was a little crass when you said that. Remember when I said, hey, if you don't volunteer, I'm gonna shut the whole children's ministry down. Remember that? We almost did, but then about eight people started serving and now we've got an amazing group of people back there that are taking care of our kiddos. And so I just wanted to go and say, if you had to park up there and you know, it was hard to get down here, I apologize. Um, we'll, we'll try to get better. We're gonna get more parking people, but I just wanted to, to uh, volunteer that. So we are in week 11 of our series in Acts and we're now gonna cover chapter seven. Um, last week is crucial for us to recap last week so that we can understand the gravity of this week. So last week, a guy named Stephen um, was called before the, the high council, the Sanhedrin, uh, the most influential, the most intelligent religious elite in the known world. And there were false witnesses brought up against him. And we learned about his character, how he was gonna do the right thing no matter what, his crazy courage and how the, the Sanhedrin, even though that they, were, they knew they probably were gonna, were gonna kill this dude, they noticed something different about him, about his countenance. And, and we learned that we need to be like that. And the only way to do that is to live in prayer, to live in the word of God, and to live in fellowship with each other so we can sharpen each other, we can bear each other's burdens, we can spur one another on uh, to good works. And so they accused him of several things. They accused him of attacking uh, the temple, uh, they accuse him of, of blaspheming Moses and the law and their holy land. And so basically Stephen knows that these dudes have basically have three sacred cows that, that they worship while claiming to worship God. And it's their holy land, Palestine. It's the law and, and Moses, which we're gonna talk a lot about today. And it's their temple where, where, where they think that's the only place you can come to worship God. And so we're, we're gonna look, um, we're gonna cover a lot of scripture today. We're gonna cover Stephen's entire sermon. So we're gonna cover the entire chapter seven. Um, and I struggled with this. Matter of fact, I was telling the team uh, this morning, I was all on cloud nine this past Tuesday because I had my message done. 
man, this is great. I can do some more counseling. I can meet with people. And then Friday, God's like, yeah, Nathan, you're not done. I need you to uh, almost completely redo the thing. So um, unfortunately for my, for my son who uploads the message notes and for my wife, I spent pretty much all day Friday and yesterday uh, working on this message. And so I gotta be honest with you, that's, that's never happened to me. But I've told them, look guys, the day's coming where I'm gonna say, you know what guys, sorry, Holy Spirit wants me to go in a different way. None of the slides are gonna work. So here we go. So I uploaded them last night at 10 o'clock and so they're good to go. So we're, we're, we should be halfway organized a little bit this morning. We'll, we'll see. But we're gonna start in Acts 7, 1. And so the high priest, now this almost certainly would have been a man named Caiaphas, which was the same high priest that interrogated Jesus. Almost certainly would have been because he was the high priest at the time according to Jewish history. And so the high priest said, are these things so? In all honesty, this was a rhetorical question. Caiaphas knew, man, I'm I'm sick of these Jesus followers. I, I just got... Peter and John, and, and man, they theologically handed myself to me. And, and this Jesus guy, I, we can't get rid of this. Why in the world does this keep coming? So I guarantee you when they're interrogating and asking Stephen this, I guarantee you that it was just a rhetorical question. Are these things so? And so basically to recap in, in, in verse uh, 11 of last week, they were, he was talking about blaspheming against Moses. It was funny because they said Moses and God. It was funny because in their hypocrisy, they literally threw God in at the last minute behind their beloved Moses. And then they also talked about the holy place and the law and the temple. And so rather than give a yes or no answer, Stephen goes into one of the most beautiful sermons, possibly the greatest sermon ever preached in the history of the church. And he, he, he knew his Bible and he goes through a, a panoramic view of the entire Jewish history over the next 50 verses. It is absolutely incredible. He, he addresses, he first addressed their first sacred cow, the Holy Land. And so the Holy Land started becoming a thing with a guy named Abraham. And what you gotta understand, maybe some of you heard the term Father Abraham. And basically Abraham is a guy who's at his father-in-law's house. He's just kind of, enjoying life. He's got servants. He's got livestock. He's got all sorts of stuff. And then God says him, he tells him, he said, Hey, I want you to get up. I want you to take everything. And I want you to go to a land and I'll tell you where it is after you leave. And Abraham does it. He literally does it. And so what I love about Stephen, and this is a point we need to look at as followers of Jesus. He starts his case out very respectfully to the Sanhedrin. Look what he says. Uh, Verse two, and Stephen said, brothers and fathers. That's an endearing and respectful term. So Stephen doesn't get all up in their face. He doesn't, he doesn't, there wasn't social media at the time, but he doesn't go to social media and go, watch this. He doesn't do any of that. No, no, no. He respectfully says, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory, say glory. Okay. Okay. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into a land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land. So Stephen's telling him into this land where you're now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. Now remember, God of glory appeared to Abraham long before the Holy Lamb was even, God was already working. God was already showing his glory. And that's what we've got to understand, regardless of the land where we exist, that we think we own of our stuff, the God of glory appeared long before the precious promised land to the Jewish people. And he blessed Abraham, even though he didn't even occupy a foot. See, Stephen's starting to theologically build his case here. Then Stephen goes into the entire lineage of the Jewish nation. He then talks about Isaac and Jacob. In verse eight, he says, and he gave him the covenant of circumcision. We're gonna talk about that in just a moment. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac 
and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. This is, this is huge in the Jewish history. The Sanhedrin would have known this. They, they would, and they were pretty much putting all of this tradition and this law and this history in front of the glory of God. They were missing it. They were absolutely missing the entire point. And then he goes into it and he gets to a guy named Joseph, who's one of my favorite Old Testament characters. And he talks about how the 12 patriarchs are jealous of Joseph because he had such favor from his father. Look in verse nine. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. He ba they basically took him, they beat him, and they said, oh, here comes some slave traders, let's just sell them to them. Then he went back to his father and said he had been killed. But God was with him and rescued him out of all his afflictions and gave him what? Favor and wisdom. And the Greek word that Stephen uses there can also translate to grace. Grace and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now, if there, was, if there was somebody that had a right to complain, it was Joseph. His brothers beat him, sold him into slavery. He then goes into his master's house, a guy named Potiphar. He earns favor with Potiphar. Well, Potiphar's wife wants to be intimate with him. Joseph refuses. She makes an allegation against him. Potiphar then throws him in the bad slammer, in the prison. Joseph did nothing wrong. Absolutely nothing wrong to have any of this happen to him. But here's the part. God gave him grace, gave him favor. And here's what Joseph did with that grace. He didn't bottle it up and keep it. You know what he did? He let it ooze out of him to others. The reason God gives us so much exponential grace is so that we can then live like Jesus and exude that grace to others. Regardless of their decisions, regardless of their beliefs. Did y'all hear that? I didn't hear one single amen to that. That's okay, that's cool, that's fine. That's why God gives us so much thinking grace that we don't deserve so that we can be a pass through and give that grace to others. And that's what Joseph did. Now wisdom, I said he gave him wisdom. Wisdom's a really hard term to define. A Couple of theologians though, I love what they said. They said that wisdom is the ability to see things how God sees them. Boom. Heard another uh, old school preacher say, wisdom's knowing what's right and doing it. But wisdom is the ability to look at a situation, to look at a person and see that situation or that person or that predicament the way God sees it. That's some next level kind of wisdom there because God does not have the boundaries of past and future. He's eternity. So he can see everything to the way it was. So Joseph is there many afflictions before Pharaoh, he raised up, then a great famine hit. And so the patriarchs, his brothers essentially, their dad sends them to Egypt to try to find food. Well, two different times they do this, then Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. And they're trembling because Joseph is literally the prime minister of Egypt, the second most powerful man in most of the known world and had the authority to do whatever he wanted to to him. And let me tell you something, this is grace. And on Thursday nights, we're learning about offense. I can't stand it. I can't. I can't stand it. I can't stand the book because it's making me look in the mirror and say, whoo, boy, I got some problems. But listen what Joseph says to his brothers. Beautiful verse, Genesis 50, 20. He says this, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. He was able to look at that situation as God looked through it, as God saw it. Now, if my brothers would have beat me, thrown me in a pit, and then sold me into slaves, whew, look out, here comes Nathan. 
But for me to be able to say, hey, guys, you know what? Man, I love y'all. What y'all meant for evil, God meant for good. And, man, God's got this whole thing worked out. And, man, I love you guys. And, oh, by the way, I'm going to bring you and your family. And I'm going to bring you to Egypt. And I'm going to feed you. And you're not. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. One of the biggest problems in the church today, and we're finding this out on Thursday nights, is dealing with offense. Because every one of us has been offended. And many of us have been truly offended. Not the whole, well, I know you are, one am I? Or the, the, the little kindergarten stuff. No, I'm talking, some of us have been cut. Some of us have been cut in the back by people who are close to us. We need to model it after Joseph. And Stephen, Stephen doesn't stop there. Listen, Stephen's just getting warmed up. Then another big king comes along that didn't know Joseph. And he gets... He, he, he wants to persecute the Hebrew nation and he gets absolutely terrified because they're so numerous. And so he's like, you know what? Look, I got a solution. We're gonna kill every boy. We're gonna kill every boy. We're gonna control this population. And so he issues a decree to kill every single boy. And it was a boy named Moses where his parents had huge faith and they basically put him in a basket some of you may have heard this story. And, and basically Pharaoh's daughter finds him and ultimately ends up adopting him. And so we get to that in Acts 7, 20. Stephen says this, at this time, Moses was born and he was beautiful in God's sight. And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. Stephen then goes through this exposition, and he talks about at 40 years old, Moses then says, I want to go visit my Hebrew people. I want to go visit my peeps. And so he goes, and he, he starts visiting me. He sees this Egyptian abusing a Jew. And so not having wisdom, not looking at it as God sees it, Moses kills him. He murders him. So now we got a murderer on our hands, okay? He goes back. He comes back to his people. He sees two of his own Hebrew brothers arguing. He says, yo, man, why, why are y'all arguing? And the Jewish brother looks at him and calls him out. Says, who made you ruler and judge? Are you gonna kill me like you did that Egyptian yesterday? So Moses then flees. And he flees for 40 years to a place called Midian, where he's trying to figure out what, what I need to do. And then God appears to Moses. And again, this, again, what is Stephen doing? Stephen is making a defense to the Sanhedrin by using God's word, not his opinion. He is allowing God and his word to defend him. Okay? And so then, so God comes to him and he says this in verse 31. When Moses saw it, meaning that bush, he was amazed at the sight. And as he drew near to look, there came a voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, take off the sandals for, from your feet for the place where you are standing is what? It's not the promised land, is it? Holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and I've heard their groaning. By the way, I just want to throw in here, there's a big difference between groaning and grumbling. Don't grumble. Don't grumble. Don't complain. Groaning is crying out your pain and suffering to God. God hears that. He makes it clear he doesn't hear grumbling though. You with me? I just threw that in for free. Okay, <laughs> and I have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. And then Stephen finishes out and says, this man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt, the Red Sea, and the wilderness for 40 years. Listen, the religious elite thought they were privileged because they were in the holy land. And today... You look at the news, fight and chaos and wars still rage over that tiny piece of property. And Stephen's like, man, 
you got to understand something. Holy ground's wherever God meets his people. Y- y'all are missing it. Y'all are missing everything. The greatest miracles in the Hebrew nation happened in Egypt. They happened when Moses parted the Red Sea and in the desert. That's where the great miracles happen. And then Stephen makes a defense. Look, the Holy Land is fulfilled with Jesus. It's Jesus. That's where we need to be. The Holy Land, you guys shouldn't have your confidence in land, in a place. You need to have it in Christ and Christ alone. So that's one sacred cow down. Two more to go. The next one is the one that they really love, the exaltation of the law and basically idolizing Moses. That's what these religious elite did all the time. And so what I would like for you to do when I talk over the next several verses, what are, you, what are we idolizing? What are we putting in front of God? What is our law? What is, who is our Moses? Is, is our Moses our, our kids traveling ball team? I'm not gonna make the joke about dance moms because y'all scare me. I don't wanna. But what, what is it? So basically we get to Acts 7, 37. He says this, this is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. Now this, he's quoting from, uh, Stephen's quoting from Deuteronomy 18. And listen, the story of Moses is incredible. I love, I love studying the character of Moses. I love what D.L. Moody, what he says about Moses. He said, Moses spent 40 years thinking he was somebody. He spent the next 40 years learning that he was a nobody. And then he spent the next 40 years discovering what God can do with the nobody. That's Moses. But he just said, I will raise, God will raise up for you a prophet like me. And then he goes in on how that prophet will speak the words of God. And here's the crazy thing. The Sanhedrin didn't want to acknowledge it, but you, a lot of people in here have heard about when Jesus fed the 5,000. 5,000 men and their families. He takes, a, he takes a couple of loaves of bread and a couple of fish and, and, and he goes in, he says, keep feeding them, keep feeding them, keep feeding them, keep feeding them, still have plenty left over. Listen what happens when the people saw that sign. The Jewish people, when they saw that sign, look what happens in John 6, 14. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the capital P prophet who is coming to the world. They literally, the Jewish people went back to the words of Moses and they're like, oh my goodness, this is the prophet Moses was talking about. Jesus is here. As a matter of fact, I don't have the scripture in here, but they, they were literally gonna take Jesus by force to make him king right then and there. And Jesus hurried up and withdrew and spent time with the father. It's incredible. So the, own, but the Sanhedrin, they were so blinded because of their pride and their hard hearts that they didn't even see it. And again, get ready, because Stephen, again, he's just getting, getting warmed up. He even talks about, look, bottom line, Our fathers rejected him anyway. Look at what he says in in verse 39. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside. And in their hearts, they turned to Egypt saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us. As for Moses who led us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. He's like, listen, our fathers didn't even listen to Moses anyway. And you're idolizing him. Neither Moses nor the law could save them. It couldn't. The law can't save us. You cannot read the Bible enough. You can't pray enough. You can't give enough to the church to earn favor with God. You can't. It is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone for salvation. That's it. And he clearly shows them they can't keep the law anyway. He talks about how their fathers worshiped other idols. Sacred cow number two, down, hooves up. Then he gets to the third one. And so he talks about going to Babylon. And then he talks about King David, who was a mighty king back in Jewish history. And God literally made a covenant with David and said, David, from your bloodline will come the Messiah. 
That's how much he loved it. The, the, the Bible describes David as a man after God's own heart. And so he, he talks about that. And then he talks about David's son, Solomon, who ended up building the temple, the massive temple that would house what was called the holiest for holies, where the presence of God would be. So he gets to the third sacred cow, the temple. And he says in verse 48, yet the most high does not dwell in houses made by hands as the prophet says. And here you're getting ready to quote Isaiah. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all things? He's quoting out of Isaiah chapter 66, first two verses. That's what Stephen's doing. Stephen's showing us how beneficial and how crucial it is for us to know scripture because he's using it like God would use it. He's using it wisely to help make a defense for what he believes. And make no mistake, it's gonna get harder and harder and harder for us to freely share Christ in society. And that shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. It shouldn't. Scripture, it literally tells us it's gonna happen. All we gotta do is agree with God. I love it when, when Jesus is, is talking to, to the religious elite in John chapter two, he, he says this. He says, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. Now, what that means is Jesus told the religious elite, hey, destroy this temple, I'll build it back in three days. And what the religious elite thought was that he was physically going to destroy it and then Jesus would place, that's not what Jesus was talking about. John, they said, Jesus, it takes 46 years to build this. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. See, I said it last week. And I'm gonna say it most weeks. You can think whatever you want about Jesus. You can think whatever you want about Hendersonville Church, but you must wrestle with the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. You're entitled to your own set of opinions. You're not entitled to your own set of facts. And the facts are Jesus Christ rose from the dead, just like he said he would. Just like he said he would. You gotta deal with that. The disciples dealt with it like, oh my goodness, that's what he meant. That's what he meant. He's raised in three days. Jesus is the temple. Now, here's, the, here's where it gets crazy. Not only is Jesus the temple, we're the temple. We are. Look at what Paul says to the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16, he says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? You see, when the Holy Spirit came, we talked about it about eight weeks ago at Pentecost, and it indwelt the believers. The moment you are truly repentant, and you are truly reborn as a follower of Jesus, the same Holy Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead resides in you and resides in me. That's, again, that's a fact. And that's what Stephen is trying to tell them. Look, the temple doesn't matter anymore, guys. You're missing it. The temple does not matter. Do you remember one of the things, we've covered it almost every time I think when we've done communion. One of the things that happened when Jesus said it is finished and he gave up his spirit that massive curtain that was in that massive temple, it was tore top to bottom in two. And what that signified was no longer does there need to be sacrifices. No longer does, does, some, does some man appointed by God have to come in the presence of God. No, 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 no. We are in the presence of God via the Holy Spirit right now. And Stephen's like, man, y'all don't get it. And they're sitting there, the saying here, I can just imagine like, man, oh man, we had Jesus and Man, he rose from the dead and man, we tried to squelch that and then Peter and John come along. Now, who in the world is this Stephen guy? What are we gonna do? Here's the crazy thing. In the beginning, Stephen was the one on trial before the Sanhedrin. But now it's almost like the tables are turned and only God can do this. And the Sanhedrin is on trial before Stephen. The persecutor has almost become the prosecutor now. And he switches his next dialect from our possessive, he's talking about our fathers. We did this, we did this. Now he goes to you. And what he does next, it is a next level amount of courage. 
he lays what I call the theological smackdown on the Sanhedrin. And listen what he says in Acts 7, 51. You stiff-necked people. I'll get to that in just a moment because theologically that's got an enormous uh, effect. Uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Now, stiff neck, that was in Exodus 32 and 33, and it's literally quoting God. And when, when they're going to the promised land, God looks, tells Moses, like, look, I'm not gonna go with you stiff neck people or I might destroy you. That's what God said to Moses. Two different times he calls them stiff necked And then uncircumcised, remember we talked about how God gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. We'll learn later on in Acts how that is a massive issue with the explosion of the church because the Jews were losing so much of a foothold to followers of Jesus, they're like, okay, fine. Jesus is away, but you also gotta be circumcised. So if you're gonna be circumcised, you gotta come and you gotta deal with all of our rules and all of our laws and we gotta maintain our status and our stature. And they finally ended up, you didn't have to, but they thought anybody that was uncircumcised, it was a common term to call them dirty dogs and how they were terrible. And by Stephen telling them that, whoo, law have mercy. I mean, you cannot imagine what, what they did. He doesn't stop there. Listen to this. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. It's crazy. Stephen's like, hey, look, your fathers killed the ones that said the Messiah was coming and you knuckleheads were the ones that killed him. Courage, wisdom. He saw the situation like God. And I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, there is no way Stephen did not realize that he was getting ready to get killed by being stoned to death. There is no way he would have known it. But here's the thing, we can judge the Pharisees all we want, how often does it happen to us? Every person in here, number one, every person in here, regardless of your belief, is made in the image of God. You're an image bearer of God, every person. Number two, the ones in here, I don't know if it's 20 people that's in here, I don't know if it's 100 people, I don't know if it's 200, I have no idea. Your salvation is between you and God. But here's the deal, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, you are called. You are called to something. And if you refuse to take heed to that call, you will get made aware of that definitely on the other side of eternity. For sure, in front of everybody. You will. Everybody in here is called. Whether it be with your services, whether it be with your money, whether it be with, I don't know what it is, but every single person in this room that claims to be a follower of Jesus, and if they actually are, you are called to be part of the greatest story in the history of mankind. Stephen was called to do every bit of this, but don't get in emotions. Again, I've, I've said this and people feel uncomfortable when I say it. And maybe I need to do a better job qualifying it. So I'll try to do a really good job now. I don't care how much of scripture you know. I don't, I don't care how many classes you've led. I don't care how many reformed theology you know. I don't. I couldn't, I couldn't care less. I care what's transferred to your heart. Now, in order for it to be transferred to your heart, you must know it. And we proved emphatically how we must live in scripture last week. We've got to. But here's the thing, the religious elite had it all up here. They had it all up here. They had it all up here. They didn't have an ounce of it here. Stephen had it up here and he allowed it to transfer to here. Take note. It may not happen this side of eternity. It may not. Life may be grand, live to a full year, full age, everything be great, all your family be great, be prosperous. But when you get to eternity, look out. Look out, it's coming. We will be judged for the good we chose not to do here on earth. And I'm not gonna apologize for saying that. James says, if you know what you ought to do and you don't do it, it's sin. It's sin. Okay, so I want us to notice how Stephen answered the high priest question. 
He didn't say yes or no. He just goes through the entire history. I made, we made this diagram. I want to show it to you real quick. So here, here's what Stephen did. He goes from the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, patriarchs, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, David, Solomon, the prophets. And he says, guys, what you got to understand, it is all fulfilled in Jesus. Every bit of it, all the laws and the prophets and everything, it's Jesus, everything. And what y'all need to understand, Genesis through Revelation points to one thing. It's not a thing, it's a person, it's Jesus Christ. And that's why all the Bible is so crucial. I love what Jesus says to the religious elite in John chapter five. He says this, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is that they bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Listen, folks, I've said this to people before and they come jumping out of their skin. I don't worship this. I don't. I worship the one who wrote it. And this is crucial to know only so I can live it out. You don't get to know the Bible to know the Bible. You get to know the Bible so you can know God. Please don't miss that. Man, oh man, I'm so sick of churches arguing over theology. Man, you go to the people in Iran right now who make prayers like, hey God, will you please make us disappear when our persecutors come? And it happens. And they asked one of the pastors there, they said, what do you think the biggest problem is with, with the church in America? You know what he said? He said theology. <laughs> and how all these denominations fight over everything. Listen, Paul said it. All I want to know among you is Christ and him crucified. That's it. How do you think the Pharisees or the Sanhedrin reacted when they saw this? When Stephen got through with this? Because one, there's not a thing they could say to it. So here's what happened. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged. That Greek word there is almost like they came unseparated from the reality self. Their mind literally jumped out almost. They were literally, they went cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and they ground their teeth at him. And then we get to Acts 755 and it says, but he, meaning St Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the what? Glory of God. When was the last time we said that? When he appeared in Abraham, to Abraham, 2000 years prior not in the Holy Land, saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God, he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the son of man, what? Standing at the right hand of God. Now here's the thing, all the other times, Jesus is referred to as sitting at the right hand of God. Here he's standing. When I investigated that, most of the early church fathers and great theologians believe that Stephen saw Jesus welcoming him. And here's my question. If you were to look up, would you see Jesus welcoming you or not? I could probably hear a pin drop right now. But anyway, would he be welcoming us? He continues in, in verse 57, and listen what it says. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. And then they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now we're gonna learn a lot about this character. Here's the thing. When Caiaphas asked Stephen that question, are these things so? He, he almost would have known Man, I know what Jesus said. I know what Peter has said twice. And I, I don't know how to explain these dang miracles. But we'll see what happens. He knew what Stephen was going to say because they had already heard it from Peter. But here's the thing. They never believed. How many times have y'all heard, have I heard, someone rightly exegete the word of God people not accept it because their hearts are hardened. My prayer is, when I pray here in several minutes, my prayer is, is that the Holy Spirit will, will, will call people into this through his grace. And listen what happened as they were stoning Stephen. Look at this. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. 
And following to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice. And whew, he could teach something on our Thursday night class. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. <whistles> While the stones were cutting in to his body and breaking his bones and crushing his skull, he was begging God to not hold this sin against them. And who was one of the people that were there? Saul. Acts 8.1 goes with this. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they all were scattered throughout regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, why do I smile when I say that? Because Jesus told them in Acts 1.8, this is going to happen. They're like, hey, Jesus, are you going to set up your kingdom now? Are we going to go in and we're going to go to, to the Romes? And man, we're going to lay the smack down on them. And man, we're going to rule everybody. And Jesus says, no, 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 it's not your time. But you will receive the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses. And where? Ju Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, which was the despised place for the Jews. They called them a bunch of half-breeds. And to the ends of the earth. It's starting. It is literally starting, just like Jesus said. They were scattered through persecution. And Saul first comes on the scene. Now, here's the thing. There's some notable things about Stephen as I wrap this up. Last week, we talked about his, his courage. This week, we see the secret behind that courage. It wasn't because he was tough. And, oh, I can do this. And I can bench press this. And I can pull back my bow. And I can do it. No, no, no. No, no, no. He, he knew that Jesus was waiting on him in heaven. He knew it. He knew that he knew that he knew that Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, was waiting on him. And he could not wait to see the welcome of his Lord. He couldn't wait. And we see, we see, that, we see that come out. And here's the thing. Here's what I want everyone of y'all to ask. What is your temple? What's, what's your law? Who's your Moses? What are you placing in front of God? Please examine your hearts. Because when you make, you put anything in front of God, anything, it's an idol. I don't care how good it is. Well, I got to save up for my kid's education. I got, you know, I got to do that. And Bobby's going to be a professional baseball player. And, and Joni Sue, she's going to be a professional dancer. And they're going to make millions of dollars so they can pay me back. Listen, those things may be great to you. I don't know, but it's not Jesus. It's not Folks, we gotta get this right. Listen, what's going on here at Hendersonville Church is amazing and it's got nothing to do with Nathan Bird. Absolutely nothing. It is all God. There are some amazing things happening, some things that I cannot wait to share with you, hopefully in a couple of three weeks. That's helping bring this whole thing where I got called crazy man for putting three quarters of a million dollars into a building we didn't own. I, just some amazing things that are happening. But here's the thing, we gotta stay faithful to God. We gotta stay humble. We can't let pride ooze in these doors. We can't. I can't. Stephen didn't. He knew that Jesus was waiting on him. It's like Jesus says to his followers in John 14, three. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Here's the other thing to know. Although incredibly short, incredibly short and seemingly senseless, Stephen's ministry was amazing. Because I guarantee you, Paul, we're gonna learn how Saul meets the real Jesus and gets converted and it turns into Paul and ends up writing almost half our New Testament. Stephen's trial had to have been in the back of his mind all the time and the way Stephen acted. The other thing Stephen did is he forgave him he forgave people that wronged him, just like Jesus did. Jesus was on that cross and they probably were spitting on him and they said, hey, if you're the son of God, come down from there and rescue yourself. And they were laughing at him. What did Jesus say? Jesus could have done anything he wanted to, anything. He's God. Father, please forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that statement literally is carried 2,000 years later to you and me. 
Father, please forgive Nathan. He doesn't know it. He doesn't know what he's doing. Please forgive him. It never, ever stops. And that's what Stephen did. And here's the last thing Stephen did. He lived like he was dying. Listen, our days are numbered, folks. I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 90, 12. He says this, so teach us to number our days that way we may get a heart of what? Wisdom, to see things like God sees them. Listen, family that's precious to me lost their dad yesterday. And it was, it was unexpected. But here's the thing, our days are numbered. I could get hit head on by a bus on my way home today. So could you. Live like you're dying because we don't know. And that's what Stephen did. One of the greatest sermons, arguably the greatest sermon ever written in the history of the church or spoke was done by a guy who had a very short ministry that a lot of people don't talk about. That's the hinge between a mighty church father named Peter and a mighty church father named Paul. And he literally is the hinge. And because of what happened to him, the church starts on its mission. Because we're gonna learn, even though they get scattered to Samaria, they're still preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. And many come to believe out there. And that's where it starts like a wildfire. So identify where you are worshiping something else other than God, even if it's a good thing. Somebody said at one time, the biggest enemy of God's best is good. Even if you think it's good, is it what God wants? Because we're all called. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> God, thank you for what your word has taught us today. God, how Stephen literally goes through the entire Jewish history in about 49, 50 verses where he talks about the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, the 12 tribes, and then Joseph, and then Moses, and then Joshua, and then David, and then Solomon, and even God even talks about the prophets. And how every bit of that, all of Jewish history rests squarely on Jesus Christ. Sanhedrin, it, it's funny, God, your word doesn't even tell us they were able to even, even say any language. It says they gnashed their teeth at him and they hollered and they, and they stopped their ears. God, they didn't have anything to say to him because of your word and your spirit. It's that same word and that same spirit, God, that, that we proclaim today. Oh, Heavenly Father, please just convict us. God, lead us. I know that there are people in here that you've called. To what? I don't know. But God, the second we become a follower of Jesus, God, we're a disciple. And how do you know you've got a disciple? Well, she or he helps pour into others and helps introduce them to Jesus and then helps lead them on this beautiful journey with you, God. That's discipleship, doing life with one another. And God, I just wanna say thanks. Thanks for all the stories that, that, that I'm hearing of of our brothers and our, and our sisters here at Hendersonville Church doing life with each other outside of these four walls. God, that is discipleship. That's what your bride did the first hundred years. There wasn't a st six step plan, God. There wasn't, there, there wasn't some sort of a, a big book about it, God. No, 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 they did life with one another. They read scripture together. They bared one another's burdens. They spurred one another on to good works. They held each other accountable. They sharpened each other. God, we need that so desperately. God, please don't ever, ever 
let our leadership be like that Sanhedrin. God, I'm gonna ask right now that if we ever get like that, God, you do whatever it takes to turn us back to you. And God, for that, that woman or that man that's here and they're, they're literally on the edge of their seat saying, I need to do something. God, even if it's fill out a care card, what you have done with these care cards has been mind blowing. Holy Spirit, help them resist the temptation of the evil one to say, I ah, don't worry about it. You can talk about it next week. I don't worry about it. It'll get better. I don't worry about it. You're strong enough to get through it. God, we're not. We need each other like we learned yesterday, last week. God, thank you for what your words taught us. And just move. We love you and we praise you and we proclaim all this in that name that Stephen said, satisfied, fulfilled, overcame everything, that name Jesus, amen.